All right, well, yeah, so thank you, Ido. As you mentioned, my name is Daniel Silkman. I'm in Gary Bader's lab, and I am studying renal cell carcinoma and trying to create a single cell map of the tumor microenvironment in this disease. So renal cell carcinoma is actually one of the top 10 most common cancer types in Canada, accounting for 7,200 new diagnoses each year. This results in 1,900 deaths annually, and this is largely driven by metastasis, which occurs in about 30% of patients. As you can see here from a graph of five-year cancer-specific survival, the outcomes for patients with localized disease uh, is actually quite good. But once this disease spreads either to the local lymph nodes or distant metastatic sites, the survival rate drops off significantly. An important aspect of this disease is that renal cancers are extremely heterogeneous. As you can see from this slide here, the histology does not even look remotely similar for different subtypes of this, this disease. Furthermore, they all have very distinct driver mutations and don't really share some of the many similar features from a transcriptional or mutational perspective. Over 75% of these cases each year will be of clear cell origin. And as a result, almost everything we know about kidney cancer comes from the study of just this one subtype of the disease. I want to give a brief background of the treatment of this disease. And as I mentioned, localized cancers have fairly good survival outcomes. And that's largely because surgery can be curative in that case. However, once you have disseminated disease, you really need some sort of systemic therapeutic option. And back in the 60s, many conventional chemotherapeutic options were tried, and so was radiation. However, that just proved to be largely ineffective. It wasn't until the 90s that we got a better understanding of this disease, first with the discovery of VHL as the driver of clear cell cancer, and later with the discovery of immune checkpoints as sort of master regulators of immune suppression in cancer. This translated first to anti-angiogenic therapies, which target the formation of blood vessels in the tumor based on the mechanism of action of VHL, and later with immune checkpoint blockade, which target these immune checkpoints to prevent immune suppression in cancer. And what I wanna highlight with this is that every effective therapy targets the tumor microenvironment rather than the cancer cells themselves. And this is important because most of the information that exists in the RCC field is really in the form of bulk sequencing, which fails to study the tumor microenvironment successfully. So this is where our project comes in. I work on what is called the REMEDY project, which stands for Renal Microenvironment Discovery. And this is an ongoing collaboration with Dr. Finelli and the urology department over at UHM. So how this project works is each time a kidney tumor is resected at UHM, some of that sample is immediately dissociated for fresh single cell RNA sequencing. In addition, we'll also viably freeze and snap freeze some tissue for later follow-up experiments, which could be anything from bulk sequencing to patient-derived xenografts. Another important aspect is that whenever we have a large and spatially distinct tumor, multi-regional samples will be taken to understand the intratumoral heterogeneity. So this cohort is almost finished in terms of sample collection, and we currently stand at 76 tumor samples from 64 patients, all of which have been profiled with single cell RNA sequencing and pair T cell and B cell receptor sequencing. Uh, what is really unique about this project is that the and eligibility criteria is extremely minimal. It's open to all tumor stages and sizes and any histological subtype of the disease. So that makes it over five times larger in terms of patient number than any published cohort, but also is the only cohort that actually represents a lot of these various subtypes of the disease as all previous studies have been focused on clear cell. So there's two main goals of this project. One, to identify all of the cell types present in the tumor microenvironment, and two, to determine how these are really driving immune dysfunction and disease progression through distinct transcriptional programs and cell-cell interactions. So to address AM1, I'm showing here a UMAP representation of about 255,000 single-cell transcriptomes, which come from the cohort I just mentioned. And as you can see, we're able to identify all of the main cell types you would expect to find in a solid tumor. Uh, the lymphocytes down here being T cells, natural killer cells, and B cells. The myeloid cell types being macrophages, monocytes, and dendritic cells the RCC cells, which is the malignant epithelium, and the stromal cells being endothelial cells and pericytes. And we can also break down the same map by histological subtype rather than cell type. And what you can see is that even though the majority of these cells do come from clear cell cases, because those are just the most common, we do get a decent representation of many other cancer types. Now, one of the things that stood out to us right away is that the proportion of cells coming from these samples varies widely depending on which histological subtype it is. When you look at a clear cell sample, over 75% of the cells will either be lymphocytes or myeloid cells, the immune populations, 
But if you look at a chromophobe sample, almost all the cells will come from the actual malignant epithelium. So this really highlights the issue of just studying one subtype and making broad claims about the entire disease. I would now want to just highlight one cell type in particular, and that is the CD8 positive T cell. So under normal conditions, this is what we consider the cytotoxic T cells. And as you can see in our data set, we are able to identify some cells shown in green here, which do have a very cytotoxic phenotype. However, there's a larger number of cells which appear highly exhausted and show a lot of exhaustion markers, such as those immune checkpoints I mentioned earlier. Now we can flip this representation instead of a UMAP to be a very max rotated PCA plot. And we see two components which really nicely separate out these cells. One contains the majority of the cytotoxic cells and the other contains more exhausted and these proliferating T cells which also display a strong exhaustion phenotype. We can draw a pseudotime trajectory through this radiant um, using slingshot and we see a trajectory that starts at the cytotoxic cells and progresses towards the more exhausted and dysfunctional cells. So what this suggests to us is that these exhausted T cells might just be occurring from more physiological cytotoxic T cells. And the question we have is, how is this exhaustion occurring? And our hypothesis would be that it's occurring through some kind of cell-cell interaction in the tumor microenvironment. And when we talk about cell-cell interactions with CCIs in single-cell data, we're referring to ligand receptor binding events occurring between cells. Uh, we can't directly measure this, obviously, from expression data, but we can infer it based on the expression of ligands and receptors in our data set. So two types of CCIs are those which involve membrane-bound ligands. An example of this would be PD-L1, PD-1 signaling, which is one of those immunosuppressive checkpoints. And another would be secreted ligands, such as VEGF-alpha, VEGF receptor signaling. And how most of these cell-cell interaction inference methods work that are published today is they consider the specificity of the interaction. And what I mean by that is if we had another cell type that could participate in the same interaction, we would consider this a non-specific interaction and it would be discarded whereas the top interaction, which occurs only between two distinct cell types, would be specific. Another class of methods will look at the expression level of ligands and receptors and only consider those which are highly expressed and discard anything below a certain expression threshold. Now, this raises a fairly obvious question, but does your method choice actually impact your cell cell interaction inference results? And this isn't really discussed enough in the field, and what most papers will do is just choose any method that has been published and analyzed the data set with it and basically trust the outcome. And we've tried this. So I'll show an example of a method called ITOC and it predicted some interactions between macrophages and CD8 positive T cells. And what we're able to find is a lot of the interactions you would expect such as those involving PD-1 signaling, CTLA-4 signaling and TIM-3 signaling, three of the important checkpoints. However, a paper came out a few months ago, which basically suggested that if we had used any other method to do the exact same analysis, our top hits would have had essentially no overlap. So this made us really revisit how we wanted to detect CCIs and generate new hypotheses. So what we've sort of settled on is a more aggregate approach to cell cell interaction ranking. And what this looks like is we're going to revisit this idea of specificity based rankings using what's called the Liana framework, which allows us to run multiple specificity methods instead of just choosing one. We're also going to include that expression-based method I talked about, pulling the expression levels of these ligands and receptors from our data set. And we want to consider differential expression, both in bulk RNA-seq data from the TCGA and single cell data from a recently published cohort, and look at differential expression between tumor and normal samples. From this, we can generate some consensus rankings of what we think might be the most biologically relevant CCIs. And I'll just briefly show some preliminary data from this. So we've generated 10 metrics, which we can classify into either specificity metrics, differential expression metrics, or expression metrics. And we are able to find cell interactions, which score consistently high across at least eight, nine, or 10 of these metrics. And I'm showing an example here of apoe trem 2 signaling, which is a potential immunosuppressive interaction, and PGF-FLT1 signaling, which is a pro-angiogenic interaction. And you can see based on the percentile rank of all these different metrics that these CCIs do consistently score high, regardless of what metric you use to identify them. So the next steps of this project are going to be to essentially generate a list of these candidate driver cell cell interactions, which might be driving immunosuppression and might be driving cancer progression. And then to validate these cell cell interactions through either spatial transcriptomics, spatial proteomics, or a combination of the two. And with that, I'd just like to thank everybody who made this lab 
this project possible. Um, my supervisor, Gary Bader, and everybody in the lab, uh, the great team I work with at UHN, and our collaborators at Celsius Therapeutics, who provide a lot of the funding for this sequencing. And with that, I'd just like to welcome any questions.